<clears throat> Let's pray as we get started today. Holy God, you are good to us, and we acknowledge that before you and in the presence of others. We ask that you extend to us forgiveness as we've forgiven those who have uh, wronged us. Give us courage to uh, move aside all bitterness and guile and deceitfulness. And help us always strive to be people of integrity and honesty before you. Bless this church and uh, the various challenges that are before it. And bless its leadership to uh, uh, conform to your will and, and uh, see the openings that you present before us. We're grateful for your providential care and for your mercy. And Father, we just uh, trust you to treat us in a way that is higher than our expectations. It's in the name of the Christ that we pray. Amen. Trying to figure out uh, how to function in our world is a challenge. And one of the reasons for that challenge is seen in the story that the kids went over in Bible class, and that's the story of Palm Sunday. Because remember on Palm Sunday that Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem on the back of a colt of a donkey, uh, not a very... Auspicious is a big fancy word. Uh, not a bit, not a very uh, uh, prominent or prestigious or popular way to come to town. I mean, uh, uh, instead of riding into town in a Cadillac, he came in a Volkswagen. Okay, it's it would be something less than everybody would expect. And, but the response of the people to Jesus was different. The reason it's called Palm Sunday is that they ripped the leaves off the palm trees. And kids, if you've ever seen a palm tree, when you shinny up a palm tree, uh, you're going to have marks on your legs. Your inner thighs are going to be scratched all to pieces because it's hard to get up a palm tree. They don't have smooth bark. They have bark that cuts you. But it was so important to them to do something that they climbed up a palm tree, they ripped branches out, and they threw them in the street in front of Jesus so that the donkey that he rode on would have a padded path. You're my hero. You're the one I look to. They shouted something called Hosanna. And they're praising God. And seven days later, they crucified him. Just because you're popular on one day doesn't mean you're going to be popular forever. And one of the fickle things, one of the tricky things, one of the things that you would not expect out of the story about Jesus is how quickly he moves from popular to unpopular. And that happened in the course of just a few days. Well, how do you live in a world that changes like that? I don't know if that kind of thing has ever happened in your life. In my life, it's happened a time or two. Um, and in the lives of those that I worked with as a counselor, it was happening to them a lot, it seemed like. They would, uh, they would tell you how everything was going well, and now it's just gone to pot. Everything was horrible. And when... I talked with them. It was my job to help them figure out not how to 
get out of difficulty, but how to react and respond under difficulty. And we have the same thing that we're going to look at today. What should Christians do every day in order to respond to adversity or respond to difficulty? Now, I'm, we've got a number of kids today, so I want to explain it in a way that you'll really get it. The reason we showed up here was not to hear me. Okay, the reason we came today was not because uh, Carl has interesting stories. I may have one or two, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is for us to come together and, and to sing to God and to sing to each other and to reflect on the good things that God does for us. And the reason we remember the things that God does for us is so that we'll be motivated by that, so that we'll look at that and say, well, that's all right, I like this. And we offer God praise. We say, we want to thank you. We're, we have gracious hearts. And we say, God, thank you for thinking so much of us when we really didn't deserve it. And the task for each one of us and the reason that we have a period of time where we have sermons is to talk about how we could do better. In the Bible, there's a big fancy word. The word is repentance. You know, you're never going to hear that word anywhere except in the Bible because people just don't talk about it. But repentance is a big fancy word that means you can do better than that. It means you can improve. It means you can do differently than you did last time. Um, at our house, we have a new dog. Maybe not the brightest dog in the world, but a dog that is highly motivated to pursue cats. Now, we have a different agenda, this dog and I. Janet says, take the dog out so the dog can do its business. And I take the dog out, and there's these dumb old cats that walk through our yard all the time. And the dog's idea of what business is, and Janet's idea of what business is, is really different. And so the dog starts trying to pursue the cat. And, you know, I am holding on to the dog. I wrap the rope around my waist and I lean back and say, no, you, you can't go do that. Now, I'm trying to get the dog to change its behavior. I'm trying to get the dog to repent, to do it differently than it's doing. Does that make sense? So if at your house you have a dog that jumps on you all the time, I would encourage you to get the dog to repent, to get the dog not to jump on you. Because when I come to your house, I don't want the dog jumping on me. Okay? So we try to teach different behavior. That's what we're going to do today. We're looking at different behavior. David, when he was king, and we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. David, when he was king, knew that he was about to die. And so he decided he had a few things that he needed to tell Solomon. And basically what he told Solomon is you need to fulfill your duty before God. Uh, it would be like... Um, Well, it would be no different than Victor's dad looking at Victor before he's going to run in an event and saying, now, you know how you've practiced. You know what we've thought about. You know what we work on. Do your best. That's what he's doing here. He's saying, remember what I've taught you. Remember the things that God has said and do your best. Now, 
Solomon doesn't always do that. He says, but if you will, you'll succeed in everything you do wherever you may go. You'll succeed because God keeps the promises that God makes. Now, that's the important thing for us to remember. The reason that we'll have success is not because we're just better, quicker, smarter, more astute than other people. It's because God gives success to those who follow him. And in this particular case, he says, you do this and we'll have a descendant on the throne forever. Now, how do we incorporate God in our lives? How do we ensure that we do this? Well, that's what I want us to think about this morning. We want to do it, one way we want to do it is by being gracious. Now, graciousness is Maybe a word that you don't hear a whole lot. But graciousness means to, uh, to know your place. It means to, to understand that uh, you have to act with other people in a good way. Um. When Hunter and I saw each other this morning, okay, we uh, slap hands, we bump chests, we, you know, do weird things, okay? Now, Hunter's a pretty good-sized boy, but he ain't nothing compared to me. And I can bump chess with him in such a way that he realizes he's less than me. Right? I mean, I can thump him hard and, and push him across the room. But that's not gracious. That's not kind. Graciousness is when you anticipate the people around you and what they need and you act in the right way. Does that make sense? So rather than um, being like a bull in the china shop, the old proverb, we act delicately. Okay? Let's, let's look at this kind of thing. We, one way that we would do this is to appreciate the kindness of others. Uh, appreciating the kindness of others would be, um, well, let me, those of you who are under 15 years old, I'm looking at you. And one of the ways that I tell how well you're doing is how you treat kids that are five or more years younger than you are. If you're too good to be around a kid because they're eight and you're 14, that doesn't speak very well for you. If it's going to pull you down to be nice to somebody who's hurt and crying and you don't want to see them they've been picked on by somebody else and you don't want to be seen as as taking care of them and so you tell them grow up or toughen up or or you know that didn't hurt that bad that's not being gracious that's not being like Jesus the reason we want to be gracious is because that's what Jesus was like all right, another way is being aware of the flaws of people, but offering support. Sometimes we get the idea if we know there's an area that somebody doesn't do very well, 
that what we really ought to do is just avoid them altogether. But I've seen teachers, coaches, uh, grandparents, and parents come to a kid that's, that's struggling and say, you know, next time you do this, you might want to try this over here. You might want to try this other thing. And so you offer support even when they have a flaw, even when they do something that doesn't work very well. Another way you show grace, graciousness is by rejoicing in the achievements of other people. I'm wearing a longhorn today. Oh, in case you hadn't noticed, I am. And they didn't fare as well in the tournament as some lesser teams. Or other teams. Okay? Now, I can say those no good Jayhawks And I can go into all the back, background of Jayhawks and why they're no good. And I can, I can come up with all kinds of things in my head. But it's not gracious. I need to be able to, and it's difficult, but I need to be able to rejoice when somebody else has success at something. And say, good job, and mean it. You know, it's difficult to say good job and not think in your head, but it should have been me. Graciousness is when that last part doesn't show up in you. And that's a hard thing to do. We have to learn to live outside our own desires. Now, some folks say, well, now why are you preaching this lesson today? Well, I'm really doing it for my wife. Janet doesn't like to make liver, and she knows that I love liver and onions, and she doesn't like to make it. And so she needs to learn to live outside her own desires. Or I could learn to live outside my own desires. I could learn to be different. Now, those are silly illustrations, but you understand what I mean by it. We, we have to develop a heart that is filled with gratitude, filled with thanksgiving, because that creates in us a greater God awareness. And if you're going to be a disciple, and, and just so the kids know today that the reason the older people are here, or I hope the reason they're here, is because they're in the, in the process of trying to figure out how to do their life better, more like Jesus. And so they're trying to figure out how to improve, and I'm tasked by elders to say, this is how you would do this. This is, this is what you might do. And so we want to have, as we move day to day, a God awareness. And that means whether it's at the end of your ball game, it's at the end of your day, it's at the end of your meal, or whether it's as you get up and prepare to embrace the day that you go, now God, I want to be thinking about you today. And one of the ways I'm going to do that is do things that I don't do automatically. Do things that take a little bit of thought. That's what improvement is about, is doing things that take extra effort. And so as I cultivate this God awareness, one of the places that 
that talks about this in, in a negative way is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. And it says that you need to get rid of bitterness, heart, hot tempers, anger, loud quarreling, cursing, and hatred. Now, if you have in your life anything that's on that list, then that's one of the targets for you this week. You need to figure out how to put that aside. Why? Not because God has a list of things that are bad. It's not simply that. It's because you're trying to be like God, and those aren't God-like qualities. And as Jesus roamed our earth, we saw what God wanted. And we've tried to incorporate that into day-to-day -day living. A thankful heart is a heart that is in the process of change. Um, when I was Henri, back before I changed. Um, I would go up to new parents and I would talk to their little child and I would say, now, here's your first sentence. Remember? Repeat after me. No, Mom, give me mine now. I said, boy, if you can get them words down, you, you know, you got this. Well, why do parents shudder when they hear those kinds of things? Because it's everything you're trying not to teach a child to do. But little kids tend to be selfish. Little kids tend to hoard things to themselves. If you ask a little child, who wants candy? They'll take the bowl. Because... They, they want it. And I don't know about you, but I've never had a little child offer me a piece of candy until they've already sampled it and it's all gooey. And I don't want it then. They never say, oh, I have a pristine one over here. Let me give you that. They always have the Snickers running down their elbow. And they say, you want a bite? No, thanks. It's because we're self-focused. But Christianity is the process of being God-focused. Putting the needs of others is more important than your own. Thinking beyond yourself. A greater God awareness creates thankfulness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. This is one of the verses I want you to be thinking about this week. Make sure that everyone has kindness from God so that bitterness doesn't take root and grow up to cause the trouble that corrupts many of you. Now look at all of the things that are said in that verse. Make sure. What that means is this is in your control. If you're making sure of something, you have the ability to do something about it. So the Hebrew writer says, you make sure that everyone has kindness from God, that you have a recognition of God's treated me all right. And you have this kindness from God so that bitterness doesn't take root in you. If you spend your life just focused on your own desires, you know what happens to you? You become bitter. Everybody's always doing things to you. If all I can think about is my own desire, then anything that happens outside of my expectation, I think is, is an attack against me personally. And I get bitter. And he tells us, don't let that take place. Now, the way that you ensure that you're not bitter is focus on 
the kindness that comes from God. Let me give you a challenge. Now, this, this is going to sound, well, maybe I need to say it a different way so it doesn't sound like that. See how I'm processing? Uh, I want you to think of the bitterest person you know. Somebody who is always sour, somebody who never has anything good to say, somebody who, who always, when, when you bring up something good, they say, yeah, but you realize this, that bitter, ungrateful person. And then, now this is where you're going to have to really use your imagination. Think about them wearing the shirt you have on today. Because that could be you. And the way that you ensure that you don't become that bitter person is you focus on the kindness of God. So this week, what we want you to do is focus on the kindness of God, and that's going to cure quite a bit of the trouble that corrupts us. And then here's the last thing. First thing is to focus on the kindness and not be bitter. Second thing is to be an active forgiver. This is not what I am best at. So that's the reason it's on my list. Have you ever... All right, now I've been trying to talk so kids can understand. There's something that's called visceral. So I have to figure out how to explain visceral to you. Visceral is something that you feel in your stomach. Have you ever had the experience where someone that you don't like gets something, has an achievement, and you think, man, I wish they didn't get that. I wish it was somebody else. Somebody gets picked for the team, and you oh, I don't know why they had to be picked for the team. Or something bad happens to that person and you have that same response that says they got what they deserved. They had it coming. See? I knew that was going to happen. When you have the visceral responses, now I'm talking to adults, when you have the visceral responses, Back to the kids, when you feel it in your guts, that's an indication that you haven't forgiven the person that it happened to. That it's still part of you. Now, let me, let me be clear. You don't take magic pills and get rid of this. You don't just say, you know what? I'm letting it go. I'm over it. God gives us a process to get over it. Now, you really don't want to know what the process is. Process is talked about by Jesus. Jesus says, pray for those who despitefully use you. Actively seek the best for those who treat you in the worst ways. And I don't want to do that. But God is saying so that you don't let bitterness grow up in you. So 
you don't allow yourself to become tainted. So you can have God awareness, pray for those who spitefully use you. And anytime someone curses you, that should be your stimulus, your reminder to actively bless them. I told you you wouldn't like what he said. This is what we do in order to be a God follower. And when I resist it, that's God reminding me that I'm resisting being a disciple. I'm resisting being a God follower. And I, I can't afford that. And so I want to be an active forgiver. Matthew 6.14 says, If you forgive the failures of others then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. We have to forgive like God does. And I'm grateful that God doesn't wait until I have it all together to forgive me. And so you can't wait until your enemy has it all together to forgive them. And so this is the other verse for you to remember. If you forgive the failures of others, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. 2 Timothy 4 illustrates this. Alexander the metal worker did me great harm, and the Lord pay, will pay him back for what he did. Now notice, he's not saying, now God get him. He's saying, I understand God's justice, and God will repay this. Watch out for him. He violently opposed what we said. At my first hearing, no one stood up in my defense. Everyone abandoned me. And I pray that what all of these people did that was cruel to me, I pray that it won't be held against them. However, the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so I could finish spreading the good news for all of the nations to hear. You, you have to do what isn't normal to be a God follower. You have to do what isn't natural. The Bible calls it supernatural, above natural. And so today we're calling on you to be forgiving and to be gracious. And those are two qualities that help us be what God wants us to be. So we create a God sensitivity in ourselves by having a gracious, thankful heart, and we challenge, we challenge ourselves to forgive in the way that our Father forgave us. If we can help you be who Jesus calls you to be, all you need to do is come as together we stand and sing.